Well, again, this morning, we're so grateful that you're here with us to worship God, but we're also grateful for our special guest preacher. Thanks to the Morris family and the Morris Distinguished Lectured Series that allows us to bring great preachers from around the globe here to our congregation to help uh, preach in our sanctuary. And if you've not heard of Lee Strobel, I would encourage you after today's sermon to pick up one of these two books or both of them. They're both great. Uh, Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel, of course, was a, a award-winning uh, journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife came to faith in Christ. And so he decided he was going to investigate the claims of Christianity, really with the intention of disproving them. But as he did the research, as he studied, in fact, there's a wonderful movie called Case for Christ. If you haven't seen it, you can uh, download it on, online now today. But if you watch the movie, you'll see that it was in investigating the claims of Christ and the investigating the claims of the resurrection and the corroborating evidence that is all there. He realized that this is, in fact, true. And so he gave his life to Christ, and it forever changed him. He left journalism, uh, began to work at Willow Creek Church in Chicago. Then he made his way eventually to California to work with Rick Warren at Saddleback Church. And most recently, he's been in Houston. And most recently, he's finished this book, The Case for Heaven. After a near-death experience he had, he wanted to investigate those who have had near-death experiences. So again, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to pick up these two books, wonderful books to read and encourage you in your faith, but also to give to a, a friend or a family member or a coworker who might have questions about faith. These books help answer many of those questions. So if you would please join me in thanking God for Lee Strobel this morning. Welcome here at our sanctuary. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you, Howard. And, and um, great to be here. I feel like I'm a, an honorary Amarilloan, or is it Amarilloite, or whatever you call uh, I feel Because he took me yesterday when I arrived here to, um, what was it, Big Texan restaurant? Yeah. We, we dined quite well. That was awesome. He said that all the guest speakers ordered the 72-ounce steak. And uh, kind of put me to the challenge. No, I, we didn't really. But we did go to the restaurant. It was, it was great. And I feel like I, I've at least been introduced to uh, uh, Amarillo that way. I'm, I'm a new Texan. Uh, we moved down to Houston, Texas uh, not long ago because uh, two of my grandchildren are down there. My daughter and her husband live there. And uh, so they live right around the corner. And they become total Texans. I mean, my grandkids. You can't believe it. I mean, they, they take horseback riding lessons. They got cowboy hats. They're really into it. But the, the reason I know they're total Texans, one night at dinner, our little Penelope uh, said, Bob, she calls me Bapa. She said, Bapa, can I pray for dinner tonight? I said, sure. So this is what she prayed. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the Lone Star State. So <laughs> clearly a total Texan now. And uh, so I, I'm from Chicago. What do I know about Texas? Very little. So I, uh, I had to go on Amazon. I bought a book called How to Talk Texan. There's a book. You can learn how to talk Texan. I bought it. I read it. I studied it. And I learned a bunch of things. First thing I learned, the difference between y'all and all y'all. That all y'all's plural. And you think about it, it makes total sense, but I never, I'm from Chicago. We don't think about those things. Uh, so I learned that. But the thing I learned that I like the most about talking Texan is that in Texas, I found out, you can say thank you to someone or you can say, I appreciate you. I just love that. I think that is so cool. I appreciate you. And that's what I want to say to, to you, to all y'all is what I want to say. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here this morning. I appreciate you taking time from your weekend to honor God and, and to listen to his word. And so I appreciate you and, and your families being here. Uh, it's such a great church. I've had a wonderful time learning about the various ministries here at this great church and uh, impacting the community in, in wonderful ways. Uh, and so as I thought about what to talk about, I, uh, I was drawn to the words of Jesus uh, when he gave the greatest sermon in history. Um, so I thought, good place to start, right? And um, at one point, he's, he, he talks about, I believe, what he uh, would like to see in all followers of his. In other words, he's looking out uh, at this group of people 2,000 years ago. But I really suspect by extension, he's kind of looking down through history. And he's looking at us today. And this is what he said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, 
How can it be made salty again? No longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. But you, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the room. In the same way, let your light shine among others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. What, what did Jesus mean by these metaphors of salt and light? I think by salt, he was saying, look, if you're going to be a follower of mine, live lives that are like salt, that, that, that make people thirst for God, that, that preserve the moral order that I've created for this world. I want you to live lives that are like light, that shine my message of hope and grace and love and redemption and eternal life, that shine that message into dark areas of despair. And the question I want to ask today is, how can you and I be stronger salt and brighter light in 2022, in the year that is about to come? How can we be stronger salt and brighter light? Well, a buddy of mine, Mark Middleberg, and I decided to write a book about this, and we thought long and hard about the title of the book, and we, de we decided to title it The Unexpected Adventure. Because we really believe if, if you're motivated to engage with people in spiritual conversations, if you make yourself available to do that, if you're prepared to do that, then you never know what's going to happen. Could start out an average and routine day, but God might open up an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation that could change someone's life and change their eternal destination. It's an unexpected adventure. And it, it is unexpected. Sometimes it unfolds in ways you never could have foreseen. For instance, Mark and I were down south speaking at a conference, and the next day we had to fly home. So um, we had to get some breakfast. We saw one of these Cracker Barrel restaurants. You've got those here, right? Uh, I'd never been to one, but he said, let's do it. I said, great. So we noticed they have rocking chairs on the front porch where people sit waiting for tables and people watch and things like that. So in order for us to get to the front door, we had to walk in front of two people in rocking chairs. First one was a young woman, about 18 years old, dark hair, dark eyes, young man next to her, about the same age. So we got to walk in front of them to get to the door. That's not a big deal, right? <laughs> so we're walking along, and just as I step in front of this young woman, I hear her say, what's a deist? And I thought, I just wrote a book about that. And I, so I turned on my heel. I looked her in the eye. I said, young lady, a deist is someone who believes that God created the universe, and then he walked away. I said, a deist is someone who believes that God sort of wound up the universe like a giant clock, and he's just letting it tick down. A deist believes that God is distant and disinterested in us. But I said, that's not what the evidence shows. They began to give her evidence for God's involvement with the cosmos, God's involvement with humankind. Start talking about the evidence of science, of cosmology and physics and biochemistry. I'm just starting to lay all these facts and all this, all this stuff on her. And she's looking at me and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And I'm on a roll now. You can't stop me. Talk about Jesus entering into human history. I talked about the incarnation. I talked about his miracles. I talked about his death. I started to give her the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And she's looking at me, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And I turned to my friend. I said, can you believe this? I happened to walk in front of her. She said, what's a deist? My friend said, Lee. She said, buenos dias. <laughs> I wish that were a joke. That's exactly what happened. It was so embarrassing. But you know what the good news was? The ice was already broken. How do you not get into a spiritual conversation at that point? Turned out she was there with her boyfriend for the state track meet. And they took us back to the hotel where the coach was and all the athletes. And we got to talk about Jesus for about 45 minutes. So it turned out all right. But it was an unexpected adventure. Friends, this is where the action is in the Christian life. This is where the excitement is in the Christian life. This is when our worship takes on a whole new dimension because we're worshiping the God of the second chance who loves our lost friends more than we do. It's when our Bible study takes on a whole new dimension because we're not just looking for, you know, abstract theological truths. We're looking for something that might help us reach a friend with the gospel. It's when our prayer life takes on a whole new dimension because we're praying, God, I'm nervous, I'm scared. Give me the courage to have a conversation with someone. It's when our dependence on God is at its greatest because we know that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing we could do in and of ourselves to lead anybody to faith. So I, this is where the action is in the Christian life. How do we become stronger salt 
and brighter light so we can have these unexpected adventures. Well, I, I started to think about this, and I thought, well, wait a minute. What if Jesus physically lived in my house? And I were able to observe him over time and, and watch how he interacted with the neighbors and, and how he went to the grocery store and talked to the cashier and stuff like that. Um, and so I studied the life of the master, and I just learned so much. And I just want to share a few things that I think we could all pick up on to have these unexpected adventures to be by being stronger salt and brighter light. The first thing I learned in studying Jesus' life is that before talking to his neighbors about their heavenly father, he would talk to his heavenly father about his neighbors. He would pray, right? Of course he'd pray. Before he embarked on anything of significance, he would bring it to the father in prayer. In fact, have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus' prayers for spiritually lost people continued right up until his final gasps on the cross? When you read the New Testament in the original Greek in which it's written, one of the uh, things you notice is the imperfect tense of the Greek suggests that Jesus didn't just say it once, but he kept repeating it during the torture of the crucifixion. I believe while the nails were being driven through his feet, while the nails were being driven through his hands, he kept praying, he kept repeating, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' prayers for people so spiritually depraved that they were torturing to death the Son of God continued right up until his final gasps on the cross. And as the famous British pastor John Stott said, in light of that, how can we justify not praying consistently and fervently and expectantly toward spiritually lost people in our lives? Now, I know theologically that my prayers can't force someone against their will to get on their knees and receive Christ. I get that. But you know what? I'm just naive enough to believe the words of James when he said the prayers of righteous people make a difference because I've seen it. I've seen it against all odds. I've seen it. I remember once at our church in Chicago, we were baptizing hundreds of new believers that day, and we invited them. We explained the gospel and what it was about, and we invited them to come on the platform to be baptized. And if they wanted to bring maybe the person who led them to the Lord or a spouse, fine. So this woman I didn't know, maybe 60, 65 years old, by that I mean young, because um, I'm going to be 70 in a couple weeks. So young woman, 65, um, comes up to me to be baptized. And there's a man with her, and he's a tough-looking bird. I mean, he's like a construction worker type. Probably didn't even use a hammer, just a fist to nail stuff. You know, you know what I mean? Just a tough-looking guy. Anyway, I turned to her. I said, you're here to be baptized. She said, yes, I am. I said, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She said, with all my heart. So I said, great. And I, I was just about to baptize her. And I didn't usually do this, but I felt prompted. I believe, my God, I, I, I turned to the man. I said, well, excuse me, sir, are you her husband? So, well, yes, I am. I said, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he glared at me. And his face kind of screwed up. And I thought it was going to hit me. And then he burst into tears. In front of thousands of people, he's weeping and sobbing. And, and, and he said, uh, no, I haven't, but I want to right now. I go, time out. Can we do this? Okay, great. So this guy in front of thousands of people repents of his sin, receives forgiveness through Christ, and I baptize him and his wife together. So afterwards, I'm walking down off the platform, and this other woman I didn't know comes running over to me. She's weeping. She's sobbing. She throws her arms around my neck, and, 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 and all she could say is, nine years, nine years. I said, who are you, and what do you mean nine years? She said, that's my brother who you just led to the Lord and baptized. I have been praying for that man for nine long years. And for nine years, I haven't seen one glimmer of interest in God, but look what God did today. And you know what my first thought was? There was a woman who was glad she didn't stop praying in year eight. Let me ask you a question. Who have you stopped praying for? Is there someone you used to lift up to God? Maybe a, someone you went to school with or an old neighbor or a family member and, and, and you prayed for years for this person and, and it's almost like we make the decision for them. We, ah, we don't say this, but our attitude is, oh, they're never going to come to faith. We just kind of give up. And I think this woman would say, don't give up. Keep lifting them to the throne of grace. Um, a few years ago, a guy asked me a question that I found very convicting. 
I don't know if you will, but I'm going to ask you the same question he asked me. He said, what if tonight you're alone in your bedroom? And what if Jesus physically appeared to you? And what if he looked at you and said, I am going to answer every single prayer that you prayed last week. If he said that to you tonight, would there be anybody new in the kingdom of God tomorrow? Are we praying? Are we praying consistently and fervently and expectantly for spiritually confused people in our life? I think if Jesus lived in my house, he'd be a model of prayer. And I'd learn from him not to give up on people I love, but God loves them even more. Second thing I think I'd learn if Jesus lived in my house is that he would let the neighbors know that his door is always open for questions. You got a doubt? Got a hesitation? Come on in, bring the Starbucks, we'll sit on the floor, we'll talk about it. I mean, I can't think of any incident in the New Testament where Jesus slam dunked anybody that came to him with a sincere question, can you? In fact, my favorite example of this is John the Baptist. If anybody should have been absolutely certain of the identity of Jesus being the Son of God, it was John the Baptist. He once pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He baptized Jesus. He, he saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus and said, I have seen and I testify. This is the Son of God. But then what happens? He gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison. Question, what happens to a lot of us when tough times come? Doubts begin to creep in, don't they? And so here he is in prison, and, and, and he starts to have some hesitations. Dare I even suggest that he started to have some doubts. And so what does he do? Does he just stew in that? No, he gets a couple friends together. He said, look, go track down Jesus and just ask him point blank, once and for all, are you the one we've been waiting for, or are we to wait for somebody else? So his friends go, they track down Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you know John. Well, he got busted, and now he's freaking out. So would you just tell us once and for all, point blank, are you the one that we've been waiting for or we to wait for somebody else? Now, here's, here's the issue. How does Jesus react to John asking this question? Does he get angry? Does he say, how dare John of all people, how dare he have the temerity to express a hesitation about my identity? No, he didn't say that. He said to those followers of John in Luke 7, verse 22, quote, Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, go back to John and tell him about the evidence that you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. So they go back and they tell John, but here's the deal. Does this now disqualify John from any role in the kingdom of God because he dared to ask a question? No. It's after this incident that Jesus gets up before a group and he says, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. John, the guy who dared to have a doubt. Friends, can I tell you something? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's okay to have questions. It's even okay to have some doubts as long as you do what John did and you pursue answers because I believe there will be answers that will satisfy your heart and soul. But here's the other thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, we are all told in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do it gently and do it respectfully. In other words, Many of us have colleagues at work or fellow workers on the job site or neighbors or family members who have what I call spiritual sticking points, questions, doubts, hesitations that keep them from um, receiving Christ, that keep them from the cross, that keep them from redemption. They have these questions, these doubts. And what Jesus is saying is, I want you to help them get resolution of those questions so that they can make progress toward me. Um, because when you're not ready to do that, you know what happens? We tend to shy away from 
engaging in spiritual conversations because we're afraid we're going to get asked a hard question. Yet so often, it's just one or two sticking points that people have. That's why I believe that we need, in the 21st century, more than ever, what's known as Christian apologetics. That doesn't mean apologizing for something. Apologetics just refers, it's from a Greek word that's used in the New Testament, that refers to making a defense for the faith, giving reasons for why we believe, providing evidence for why we believe, for instance, that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, so in other words, that we don't just know what we believe, but we know why we believe it. Because I think uh, there's so many friends of ours who have those spiritual sticking points that we can help them get past it and make progress toward making a real decision about Jesus. A friend of mine said that evangelism in the 21st century is spelled apologetics. It's increasingly necessary because we live in an increasingly skeptical and even often hostile world. We need to be ready to give reasons for the hope that we have. And the good news is we have a credible faith. We have good answers to the toughest questions of life. I've seen this demonstrated so many times. I remember back in the mid-1990s. Actually, I think it's the early 1990s. Um, I was a teaching pastor at a church in Chicago. And a friend of mine from my days when I was an atheist uh, was one of the most prominent atheists in America. He was the national spokesman for American Atheists Incorporated. And so after I became a Christian, of course, our relationship became very interesting because we would have these little conversations and debates and arguments about God, and it was very um, exciting. Um, but one day he said to me, you know, Strobel, you Christians are all alike. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, you'll give the case for Christ, you'll give the evidence for God, but you won't then give the evidence against God and then just let people make up their own minds. I said, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what. You go find the smartest atheist on the planet, and I will fly him to the church where I'm a teaching pastor. I'll allow him to stand on our platform and proclaim the case for atheism. But I'm going to get a Christian, and that Christian's going to present the case for Christ, and then he'll debate your atheist, and we'll just let people make up their own minds. He said, you wouldn't do that. I said, oh, yeah? We shook hands on it? My very next thought, I probably should ask the senior pastor if this was okay. <laughs> Too late. This ball was rolling. This thing took on a life of its own. Nobody was doing debates back then. This was a huge deal. Chicago Tribune did four advanced articles on this debate. Uh, talk radio, talk television, buzzing about it. Why? Because the church said, we're not afraid to have an intellectual shootout. We're not afraid to put our faith to the test. Pretty soon I started to get phone calls from radio stations around the country. Can we broadcast this debate live? Sure. Pretty soon we had 117 radio stations coast to coast going to broadcast this debate live. I mean from Alaska to Florida to Maine going to broadcast it live. One radio network sent commentators like it was a prize fight or something. There's a jab by the Christian. I think the atheists on the ropes. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. The night of the debate came. Traffic was gridlocked within two miles of our church. We opened the doors to our auditorium. People ran down the aisles to get a seat. When's the last time you saw someone run into a church? We had 7,778 people show up. We overflowed our auditorium. We had live um, um, closed-circuit television hooked up to other rooms on our campus. We had coast-to-coast -coast radio about to go on the air, and I'm going to be the moderator. I'm pacing backstage. I'm nervous. And one of our elders came up to me and said, So, Strobel, we are going to win this, aren't we? I... <laughs> So the debate begins, and we chose as our representative of Christianity a man I consider to be one of the finest defenders of the faith in the world, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig. He gets up, and he gives the most powerful 25-minute summation of the evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity you have ever heard. I wanted to shout, but I thought, I'm the moderator. I had to be neutral. So thank you, Dr. Craig. And now the atheist, Professor Zindler. Yeah, good luck, buddy. So this guy, they picked their best guy. We didn't want to get accused of picking a weak atheist. So we said, you pick anybody you pick. They picked their best guy. He gets up, stands behind the podium. He's about to open his mouth. But we didn't tell him one thing. Not that he would have cared, but 
we didn't tell him that right where he was standing underneath the platform was a room. And that room was filled for the entire two and a half hours of the debate with Christians who were praying that the case for Christ would go out with all its convicting power and the case for atheism would be recognized for the bankrupt philosophy that it is. And if you've seen the video of that debate, it's on YouTube, you can check it out. Uh, you know God answered that prayer because we had people vote. What's your spiritual condition as you come in? Who won the debate? What's your spiritual condition as you leave? Initially, we just took the ballots of the people who came in as skeptics, as agnostics, as atheists, as non-believers. Just among that group, having heard the case for Christ and the case for atheism, 84% said the case for Christ was by far the most compelling, and 47 people walked in as confirmed atheists, heard both sides, and walked out as followers of Jesus Christ. And you know what else? Not one person became an atheist. I'm just saying. Friends, we have an unfair advantage in the marketplace of ideas. We have truth on our side. That, that's, a, that's a big advantage. So, so what's, my, what's my takeaway from that? Is my takeaway, therefore, we all ought to go out and debate people? No. God has gifted certain people who have PhDs, and, and, and this is their ministry to do debates, you know, I got a lot of friends who are atheists, wonderful people, love them. Um, and I, I've, I've, see, I've set up these debates. I've moderated these debates. But I'm not a debater. You're probably not a debater. It's a certain skill set. You have to know what you're doing. That's not me. I think for the average Christian, the key word is not debate. It's dialogue. It's conversations. It's relationships. It's friendships. It's having a friendship with someone who may be far from God, and yet we have a, a safe place in that relationship where they can express what they believe and why they believe it. They ask you what you believe and why you believe it, and you have a conversation, you have a friendship where we, we ask more questions than we give answers. Uh, it's where we um, 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 don't force feed stuff, but we listen more than we uh, you know, are, are trying to dominate the conversation. Uh, it's where we validate people as being made in the image of God, that are valuable to God, that are loved by God. Atheists are not our enemies. God loves them. I love them. And so I want to have a relationship. I want to have a friendship where we can be honest with each other and each talk about why we believe what we believe. And sometimes in the midst of that, they may ask you a question and you have no idea how to answer it and that's okay. You know what you say in those cases? That's a great question. I don't know how to answer it, but why don't we find an answer together? And there's so many good resources out there. You can agree to read a book together uh, that deals with that specific question. But I think if Jesus lived in my house, the door would always be open. Come on in, sit in the floor, let's talk about it. Number three, I think if Jesus lived in my house, he wouldn't just share his faith, he would show his faith. In other words, talk is cheap. Jesus did not just talk about loving the world, but he showed that love, how? By becoming a servant. He served the blind by restoring their sight. He, restored, he, he, he served those with leprosy by restoring their health. And in the greatest act of servanthood in the history of the universe, he went to the cross to pay for the sins of many. And friends, when we sacrifice in serving others as Jesus would. It opens hearts to the gospel that are otherwise impervious to the gospel. You know, earlier I quoted Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine among others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The word good there when it, in the Greek when it talks about good deeds does not simply mean good deeds as opposed to bad deeds. There's another nuance, there's another connotation to that, that these would be attractive and winsome deeds. So what Jesus is really saying is, I want you to serve other people in a winsome and an attractive way that causes their eyes to drift heavenward toward your heavenly Father who motivates you against the grain of this me-first world to put someone else's needs ahead of our own. And when we do that, that cracks open hearts that have been hardened against the gospel. Um, so I believe if Jesus lived in my house, 
he would kind of have a personal compassion radar that he would be scanning the neighborhood with. Kind of beep, 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 just looking around. How can I serve? How can, how can I reach out to other people? And, and we can do that. We can have that kind of compassion radar as we walk through life, as we are in our neighborhood and so forth, or at work. We can have a compassion. We can look for opportunities. You know, there may be a widow who lives down the block. And if, if, if you would go grocery shopping for her once a week, that would be such a blessing. Or there may be a kid down the block and he put a basketball hoop on his driveway, but he doesn't have anybody to shoot baskets with. Say, hey, why shoot, I'll shoot baskets with you. Or maybe there's a single mom who's got two kids and her life is so busy. She's working two jobs, got two kids, life is hard. And what if you went to her and said, hey, what if my spouse and I babysat your two kids for the next four Friday nights just so you can have some time to yourself? I mean, what a blessing that would be. Um, so I believe if Jesus lived in my house, he'd be looking with his compassion radar for those kind of opportunities. But you know what? We can do that too. Finally, I think one last thing, if Jesus lived in my house, is kind of related to that point, is that above all, Jesus would be authentic in the way in which he related to the neighbors. He'd be authentic. In other words, he wouldn't just communicate the gospel, he would embody the gospel. There would be a consistency between his beliefs and his behavior, between his character and his creed. And the real question is, what do your neighbors see in you? What do they see in me? Because I can almost guarantee you something. If your neighbor knows that you are a Christian, if your neighbor knows that you attend this great church or another church in this community, if your neighbors knew that you were in church today, I can almost guarantee you they have their own radar scanning your life. You know what it's called? The hypocrisy radar. Beep, beep. beep. You know they're watching you, right? Are you aware of that? 24-7, they're watching you. What are they looking for? False piety. What are they looking for? Kind of a holier-than-thou attitude. What are they looking for? Someone who posts on a phony Christian happy face and pretends like everything's always great when we know it's not. What do they see? I got a letter a few years ago from a young woman who'd been poisoned against God and the church because the Christians she knew when she was growing up were inauthentic. They abused her. I'll just read her own words. This is what she wrote me in a letter. She said, Lee, 24-year-old nurse, Maggie, she said, Lee, the Christianity I grew up with was so confusing to me, even as a child. People said one thing, but they did another. They appeared very spiritual in public, but in private, they were abusive. What they said and what they did never fit. There was such a discrepancy. So listen to this. I came to hate Christianity and that did not want to be associated with a church. Friends, that is the power of inauthentic Christians to repel people from God. You know, Jesus used these metaphors of salt and light in a positive way. But the ugly truth is there are Christians who are like salt in a wound. There are Christians who are like headlights that glare on a highway that cause people to turn their head the other way. That's the ugly truth, and that's what happened to Maggie. But then guess what else happened? One day, she's reading the Chicago Tribune, and she sees an article about a debate that's coming up at a church between an atheist and a Christian, the debate we did. And she said, I want to go to that debate just to see the Christian humiliated. So she came to our debate. And, of course, the Christian clearly won the debate. So now she's full of questions. And so she would write me letters because I was a moderator. So she'd write me questions, letters. She'd say, Dear Lee, uh, here are my first ten reasons I don't believe in God. Boom, 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 boom. So i get her letters. I'd write her back. Dear Maggie, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're asking. These are great questions. I'm glad you're asking them. Let me see if I can help a little bit. And then I said, this is stupid. So I called her up. I said, Maggie, we're so glad you came to our debate. I'm so glad you're asking these questions, but I'm not sure this is the most efficient way to get answers. I said, we have groups in our church called spiritual discovery groups. They're for people like you who don't yet believe in God. Spiritual seekers, people confused spiritually or just don't know what to believe, that's fine. They're welcome into our groups. We have half a dozen of those and a Christian couple that leads the group. And if you join one of these groups, you can get your questions answered over time and make some friends. 
She said, that'd be great. So I got her into one of our groups. So let me read to you a letter she wrote after having been in that group for quite a while. Um, why? Because Jesus said to you and me, be salt and light. And sometimes we look at our world and we say, what do they want from us? How can I do that? What, what are they looking for from us? Well, Maggie expresses it so well in this letter. She said, Lee, when I came to church into my small group, here's the first thing she needed. I needed gentleness. I needed to be able to ask any question. I needed to have my questions taken seriously. I needed to be treated with respect and validated. But most of all, listen to this, most of all, I just need to see people whose actions match what they say. I'm not looking for perfect, but I am looking for real. Integrity is the word that comes to mind. I need to hear real people talk about real life, and I need to know if God is or can be a part of real life. Does he care about the wounds I have? Does he care that I need a place to live? Can I ever be a whole and a healthy person? Well, I've asked questions like these of the couple, the Christian couple that leads my group, and I've not been laughed at or ignored or invalidated. I've not been pushed or pressured in any way. In fact, she said, I don't understand the caring I receive from the Christians who lead my group. I don't understand that they don't seem to be afraid of questions. They don't say things like, you just have to have faith or you just need to pray more. They don't seem to be afraid to tell who they really are. They just seem genuine. And then she enclosed a copy of a poem that she wrote for the Christian couple that led her group. But ever since I read this poem for the first time, I said, no, no, no. This is a poem that every Christian on planet Earth needs to hear. Why? This is the heart's cry of the very kind of person who God has told us to reach out to, to be salt and light to. This unfiltered poem expressing the sentiments of her heart. So listen to this poem written for the Christians who lead her group, but I think it's for you. I think it's for me. Imagine 24-year-old nurse poisoned against God in the church because of abusive Christians. Listen to what she wrote to the Christians who lead her group. Do you know, I mean, do you understand that you represent Jesus to me? I mean, do you know? Do you understand that when you treat me with gentleness, it raises the question in my mind, well, maybe he is gentle too. Maybe he isn't someone who laughs when I get hurt. Do you know? Do you understand that when you listen to my questions and you don't laugh, that I think, well, what if Jesus is interested in me too? Do you know? Do you understand that when I hear you talk honestly about arguments and conflicts and scars from your past, that I think, well, maybe I am just a regular person instead of a bad, no good little girl who deserves abuse. If you care, then I think maybe he cares. And then there's this flame of hope that burns inside of me, and for a while, I'm afraid to breathe because it might go out. I mean, do you know? Do you understand that your words are his words? That your face is his face to someone like me. Please, be who you say you are. Please, God, don't let this be another trick. Please, let it be real this time. Please. I mean, do you know? I mean, do you understand that you and you and you, that you represent Jesus to me? Well, I read that poem for the first time in my office at the church, and I cried. Because what flooded into my mind were not all the times I've been like Jesus to people. It's all the times that, that, that um, I haven't given a rip about the guy who lives a nine iron shot from my house who's headed for hell. I said, this has got to stop. So I called up Maggie. I said, Maggie, thank you for your letter and your poem. It means a lot to me. I found it very convicting. And I'd just like to know if I could get your permission to read it to the whole church this weekend. I think everybody should hear it. And she said, oh, Lee, haven't you heard? 
and my heart sunk. I thought, oh, no. What's happened now? What inauthentic Christian has she met now that's repelled her again from God? I said, no, Maggie, I haven't heard. What happened? She said, no, it's a good thing. I said, what? She said, Lee, on Tuesday night, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I said, Maggie, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. The party's probably still going on in heaven. That's fantastic. But oh my goodness, you were so far from God. You were running the other way. I got to know something, Maggie. What brought you to faith in Christ? What brought you across the line of faith? What five facts did you learn that convinced you that the resurrection of Jesus is an actual historical event? So it wasn't like that with me. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What 10 facts did you learn that convinced you that the Bible really is the word of God? She wasn't like that with me. I said, well, then what happened? What, what, what happened? And now she's kind of embarrassed. She kind of shrugged her shoulders over the phone. She said, well, Lee, I, I just met a whole bunch of people at church who were like Jesus to me. And I thought, what a lesson. What a lesson for someone like me that likes to pin somebody up against the wall. I'll give you 10 reasons for the resurrection. Don't like those. I'll give you 20 more. But keep in mind, she came to the debate. She heard the evidence for Christianity spelled out and defended by one of the greatest defenders of Christianity in the world. She heard it put to the test by an atheist. She heard the evidence. But what did God use to bring her across the line of faith? I know the Christian couple that led her little group. They are quiet, introverted, simple people who love God and love others. They loved her into the kingdom of God. And you know what the good news of that is? We can do this. You don't have to have a PhD in theology to do this. We can do this stuff. We can pray for people. We can all do that. We can, um, you know, we can help them find answers to their questions, even if we don't have them. We can point them toward resources to get answers to their questions. We can do that. We can serve other people. We can look for needs in their life and love them through serving them. But the easiest thing of all is to just be authentic in who we are. We don't have to be smarter than we are. We don't have to be more spiritual than we are. We can be sinners saved by grace. And we can love people into the kingdom of God. And you know what? Along the way, you will have unexpected adventures that will be the joy of your life. And I'll just end with one of my favorite unexpected adventures that God brought into my life when I was a new Christian. And I was a newspaper editor in Chicago. And it was the end of a long day, and I'm packing up my stuff to go home. And I felt the Holy Spirit. This doesn't happen to me very often. But I felt the Holy Spirit in a very distinct way, nudging me to go into the business office of the newspaper and invite my atheist friend to Easter services at our church. I mean, it was very distinct, and I'm thinking, this is great. If God is leading me right now to go and share the gospel, invite this guy to church, he's probably going to repent right now. He's going to get on his knees right in the business office of the newspaper. I just know it. I had so much confidence. So I walked over to the business office. I walk in. I look around. All I see is my friend behind his desk. So I walked over to him. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. I said, hey, you know, Easter's coming up. He said, Strobel, I'm an atheist. I don't observe Easter. I said, yeah, 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 I know, but um, Easter is when we remember the resurrection of Jesus. He said, oh, he wasn't resurrected. I said, actually, there's good historical evidence he was. I began to give him some of the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And I went on for several minutes doing that. But then after a while, I'm thinking, this isn't working. So I kind of took a step back and I said, well, let me just ask you a question. Do you have any questions about God? He said, no. Oh, okay. Um, I said, do you ever think about God? He said, no. I said, oh. I said, wait a minute. You love music, right? Oh, yeah, I love music. We got great music at our church. Why don't you and your wife come with Leslie and me to church this Easter? I think you'll love the music. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want to go to your stupid church. Hey, no problem. Listen, you know where my office is. If you ever have a question, you know where I'm at. Uh, Okay, bye. I walked out, and I'm thinking, what in the world was that all about? Why did I feel so distinctly led to go and and, and, and talk about the evidence for the resurrection, share the gospel, and invite this guy to church? And he shut me down. And this bothered me for years because to this day, he's an atheist. 
But let me tell you the rest of the story. Several years later, by then I was a pastor at a church, and after I spoke on one Sunday morning, a guy came up to me I didn't know, and he said, could I shake your hand and thank you for the spiritual influence you've had on my life? I said, that's really nice, but who are you? He said, let me tell you my story. He said, a few years ago, I lost my job, and I didn't have any money in the bank. I thought I was going to lose my car. I thought I was going to lose my house. I needed a paycheck for a while to get by. So I called a friend of mine that ran a newspaper. I said, do you have any odd jobs I can do to earn a buck? And the guy said, well, can you tile floors? I thought, yeah, I've tiled my bathroom. I can tile floors. And the guy said, well, we need some tile install and repaired at the newspaper. If you can do that for a while, we can pay you. So I said, great. He said, I went to work at the newspaper. He said, one day, not long before Easter, I was in the business office of the newspaper. But I was on my hands and knees working on some tile on the floor behind this big desk. And you walked in, and I didn't even think you knew I was there. And you start talking to this guy about God. And you start talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And you start inviting him to church. And this guy was shutting you down. But I'm on my hands and knees working on this tile, listening to all this stuff, and I'm thinking, I need God. I need to go to church. As soon as you left, I called my wife. I said, we're going to church this Easter. She said, what? I said, yeah. She said, we came to church at Easter. I came to faith. My wife came to faith. Our teenage son came to faith. And I just wanted to thank you. And I thought, here's a new form of evangelism, ricochet evangelism. <laughs> you share your faith. It bounces off a hard heart. You don't know where it's going to go. That's the unexpected adventure of the Christian life. You don't want to miss this. We can't do this in heaven. This is our one opportunity to be strong salt and bright light and allow God to take us on a series of unexpected adventures that will be the joy of our lives. So let me pray for us in that endeavor. Father, thank you for this great church. Thank you for its great leadership. Thank you for these wonderful people who are here today. And I pray that you would use us as strong salt and bright light in this coming year, 2022. May this be the year of evangelism for us. May it be a year in which we take spiritual risks to get into conversations, to build friendships with others who don't know you. And we will trust that you will take us on unexpected adventures through which you will be glorified and people will come to faith in you through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless, I was going to say y'all. God bless all y'all. Amen.